डॉक्टर जगत हेलो हाँ डॉक्टर जगत कैन यू हियर यस आई कैन हियर यू सर या वील स्टार्ट वील स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम नाउ श्योर सर वी कैन या वी आर ऑन लाइव आल्सो सो पार्टिसिपेंट्स कैन इनफॉर्म देयर फ्रेंड्स इफ दे वांट टू वाच दिस प्रोग्राम लाइव दे कैन वाच इट इन द लिंक गिवन इन द ग्रुप ओके अच्छा am i audible okay good morning all uh, on behalf of department of prosthodontics and implantology indira gandhi institute of dental sciences pondicherry i welcome you all for today's session for today the topic is the use of cbct in diagnosis of oral common lesions for today's session we have an eminent speaker with us dr jagat reddy professor and head oral medicine and radiology Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences Dr Jagat Reddy uh, MDS in oral medicine and radiology has completed his graduation and post graduation from Sri Ramachandra University Chennai he has an experience of about 16 years he is currently spearheading as the professor and head of oral medicine and radiology in Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences he is also known for his dexterity in dental oral health knowledge oral health research and disease analysis managing potentially malignant diseases and using advanced investigation like cbct we are extremely honored to have you sir amongst us today and we are appreciative of the fact that you could spare some time out of your busy schedule now uh, i'll request dr jagat reddy to kindly take over so please thank you doctor thank you and uh, a very good morning to all the participants here i hope i'm here so we can all be here so for the next one hour i'm just going to go down cbct i know all of you really love this tool you might like this tool a lot a uh, lot of amazing stuff can be done and uh, cbct is a more interactive and friendly to you know our understanding So we have to do all of the matter. They are making. Sorry, sorry, doctor. Hello. Uh, your voice is not so clear. Uh, it's getting interrupted. Uh, I'm afraid that there there is any signal. Okay. Uh, Just check your voice. Your audible. Is it okay now? No, no. It's getting cut. It's getting cut. it is interrupted okay okay is it is it any other sound or is, is my voice breaking yeah it's breaking okay uh, i'll just check the next give me one minute Am I better off now? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Am I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Oh. Okay. So it's uh, nice being with all of you. So let's begin uh, with CBCT. It's a wonderful tool of uh, this generation. Definitely a blessing in disguise to all of us. So the primary objectives of the next one hour that we are going to cruise through are. one we would uh, try to orient ourselves towards understanding the facial planes and their corresponding radiographic views what they are known as once we are good with this you will see uh, you have one you are one step up towards you know being comfortable with cbc so the moment you are oriented to what you are going to see so once you are oriented we are just going to look into a few common lesions of the jaws you know on a cbct how they appear and how easy it is for us 
to catch and how informative it is. You know, so that helps us plan our treatment in a much better way. So, oops, here we go. What do we have here? We are staring into, you know, <laughs> all of you, I hope, had your breakfast. So there's a loaf of bread. And uh, why am I having a loaf of bread here? It is for us Hello. to understand. Hello. Hello. Mama, what's up? Hello. Uh, I would like the participants oh. to kindly mute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we are staring into a loaf of bread here, right? So this is basically to make you understand what are the various sections. Now, it all depends on how I cut this loaf of bread, right? In different angles. It's possible for me to cut it through the length, you know, through the length like in this picture. Or I can cut it, you know, through the width of the bread like in this picture. Or I can cut it from one side to the other side, like in this picture. So the, all these three are forming three different views. Or they're giving me three different dimensions of this loaf of bread. So when I'm going to cut through, you know, uh, take a look at these three skulls which are present there. Now, the first one is if I'm going to make sections from the base of the mandible, horizontally going up till the vault. So that kind of a section, right, is you know, something depicted by this loaf of bread here. It's called an axial section, okay? And the plane is a transverse plane, but radiologically we call it an axial section. So the moment somebody says axial section, we should understand that this skull is chopped from the base to the top, right? So each chop, now for example, you see this uh, gray chop here, right? So that is the axial section of this particular region. Okay. Likewise, the next chop of bread is uh, sliced. This is, you know, the usual sandwich slices that we get. So if I'm going to chop my head from front, from the nose to back to vault, you know, along the length of the skull, right? So then it's going to form a section called the coronal section. Okay. So that's the coronal section. Likewise, if I'm going to chop my skull from one side to the other side, lengthwise running through, you know, so this is a mid sagittal plane, right? So if I'm going to make my slices parallel to the mid sagittal plane, so this is how the bread is going to look, and my skull is, if I'm going to chop my skull in those lines, then I'm getting a sagittal. So basically, it is to understand that the three planes that we require to understand our CBT. And these are the three dimensions that we acquire while doing a CBT. Now, before I jump into the next slide, let's understand one another small you know, uh, trick of the trade. That is, when we do a normal radiograph, that is two-dimensional. So either I get my, you know, the lateral view, you know, or I get my, you know, frontal anteroposterior view. So these are the only two dimensions possible on a regular radiograph. The axial view is something which we do not achieve on a conventional radiograph other than on an occlusal radiograph, which kind of gives us just that one section of axial. So that is why on two dimension images, we would never achieve you know, the entire volume or we can never comment on the entire size of a lesion that we're looking into. Even mathematically, if you want to bring in some calculations, like you want to measure the distance between point A and point B, it's only possible with accuracy on if you have all these three dimensions. It's not possible for you to do that on two-dimensional images. And another problem with two-dimensional images is there's always, an, you know, they are inherent with some amount of magnification. But for some uh, CBCT, there is no issue of magnification as such. Right? We have perfect image, perfect size, perfect quality. So your measurements are pinpoint accurate, and you can depend on them without second thought. So let's, these are the orientation planes, right? Once again, quickly, if I'm going to slice it down from the base of the mandible to the top of the skull or vice versa, you know, that section is called a axial section. If I'm moving it from the front to the back and to posterior direction, then these sections are called my coronal sections. If I'm moving from left side to the right side along the mid sagittal plane parallel to the mid sagittal plane, you know, so, so this is the mid sagittal plane. Running across from one side to the other, these sections are called my sagittal sections. So these are the three dimensions that will help us understand the extent, the size, and the nature of the lesions which we are going to evaluate. So moving on to give you a better picture, right? So these are all images.
images. Now let us see how an axial section, you know, right now this is in the maxillary region, right? This axial section here depicts the maxillary. So, uh, okay, uh, so how will it look on a CBT? This is how an axial section looks on a CBT. So this is at the mandible level, sorry, it's not uh, correlated to this, but this is at the mandibular level. And at the mandibular level, this is how an axial section looks. So technically, this is like looking into the mandible from the top, right? From the top, I'm looking into the mandible and I'm able to see the mandibular teeth. So that's my axial section. Coronal section, this is like looking at yourself in the mirror, right? Take a look at the coronal section. This is looking at yourself in the mirror. So you want to move from front to back. So this is at the, uh, now right now, this particular section is somewhere uh, at the maxillary sinus level. So I can see both my maxillary sinuses here and the corresponding region, the teeth occur in the lower arch. So nasal septum. So this is a coronal view. Coronal view is more of like looking into the uh, kindly which are participants, kindly switch off your microphone. Please do not disturb in this room. Yes, thank you. So the coronal section. This is like uh, to understand in simple words, it's like looking into the mirror now at your face. So you start so your face, go back to your head, and all through your coronal section. This is how it looks on a TV. Gives a lot of information. The sagittal view, it's more like a lateral set view. It's like looking at yourself from the side, on the side view. So you're moving from one side to the other side of the side. And this is our sagittal section. Now, based on these three uh, you know, planes, the computer would reconstruct a model. These are those models that it reconstructs. You know? This is how it looks from the side. Once these three are put together, you know, the three planes, then you get a 3D reconstruct. This is called a 3D, three dimensional reconstruct. And, you know, from the front and from below, from below, this is the base of the mandible, and I'm looking into the phallus here, right? This is like looking from below. So, these are basically toys. Now, most of us get excited about having these uh, reconstruct models there, and you know, when you turn them, they turn around all angles. You can look into it. These are basically toys. These are not meant for diagnostic purposes. These are meant for patient education. They're more like models, right? The models that you show in your clinic to you know, teach patients to brush their teeth, something like that. Right? You can, this is understandable for the patient. This is the patient's life. Whereas this is the doctor's language. We need these three dimensions to make our diagnosis and plan our treatment. So uh, I know I, I do see a lot of uh, students who come from okay. and want. Dr. Jagat? Yes, sir. Ah, so uh, people are telling their voice is not clear. We are also feeling it. Voice is getting a little bit of uh, interrupted. I don't know whether it's the mic or. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, am I clear now? No. No, sir. Yeah, but you can hold the mic at, at one particular point. It's okay. I yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I'll hold it like this, and I'll be done. So that, that is it uh, audible now? Is it better? Little far from your mouth, not so close. Okay. Is that, is that better now? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll uh, continue with. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. So these are the, uh, basically these are the models that uh, we can use to teach the patient. So these are the three vital uh, planes that we need to understand. And this will help us come to diagnosis and plan our treatment. So now let's look into the sections with a little detail. Uh, first, let's look into the axial section. So you do remember the axial section, that is we are running the sections from the base of the mandible to the vault of the head. Cutting every cut from here would be an axial section from bottom to the top. So now there is a gross anatomy here. In the gross anatomical specimen, we, are, we have cut out the section at the maxillary sinus. Take a look at you know, the, this is, these are the two maxillary sinus, left and right side, and you have your nasal septum here. So we, this is the cadaveric section at the maxillary sinus level. And the same level has been imaged. This is the axial section on a CBCT. Of this particular at this particular level. So take a look at this. The two maxillary sinuses we're able to see here. The nasal septum is here. And the other structures to your coronal process is at the mandible. So your condyle will appear in a short time. So this is how an axial section looks. So please do remember how.
how did we slice the loaf of bread through the lens? How did we slice the uh, pulp from the base, right? From the base to the top, through the lens of the pulp. And this is the, this is how we slice the pulp. And this is the anatomic view, and this is the axial section, radiography. Axial sections are very useful to us in a number of ways. We are getting into diagnostics and patient planning. Next is the coronal section, the lobe of bread that we slice. Take a look at the cadaveric section. So we have up to the length of the face on top to the bottom, the coronal section. This is like looking into the mirror, right? So this is how it looks, this is the coronal section. And in the coronal section, if you look at the mandible, it's fantastic. You are getting a buccolingual relationship here. You know, so this is one of the important relationships that we do not tend to see. You know, in uh, the regular conventional radio. So this buccolingual relationship is something that is evaluable on the coronal section, right? So this is our coronal section for our understanding. The next one in the final third dimension would be the sagittal section. Just like cutting your bread loaves lengthwise from side to side. This is how we make bread sticks. They look like bread sticks. So take a look at the gross anatomy. You start slicing the head from one end to the other end. So at this particular region, you know, somewhere mid, midway through the skull, you have made a section. So this is a sagittal section, and this is the appearance on a radiograph. So this is how it uh, looks in the sagittal section. So these are the three sections. Now that is with gross anatomy. Now when we look at tooth with the same section, right? So an axial section, you know, the, an axial section, this is how. So you are able to look through the cross section of the teeth. Right? These are the roots, the roots with the root canal, right? Coronal is running through the length of the tooth, and sagittal is running from the lingual to the buccal side of the tooth sections. So this is how they would appear in the tooth. The one the previous slide that we have just uh, visualized were the ones with you know the gross anatomy, whereas uh, this one is depict the tooth to us. Right? So here, let's take a closer look at actual Dr. Dr. Hello. Uh, Dr. Jagat. Yes. Uh, there are some uh, participants uh, asking your voice is not clear. Uh, can something be done? Can you move out of your cabin or something? Uh, okay, so just give me one yeah. minute. Yeah. I will just try to move out. Participants, please hold on for a moment. Uh, he'll get back to you. Just uh, minutes or so. Hello. Yes. Am I audible now? Is it better? Yeah, little better. You talk, we'll see, sir. Okay. Uh, so, okay, I hope I'm audible now better. And, uh, okay, so let's continue. And, uh, these are the. Well, it is. Okay. Your mic, uh, my headset is a problem, I feel. Yeah. 
Is it okay now, sir? Is it audible now? No. Hello. Yes. Yeah, better. I'm better now, sir. Yeah, yeah. Audible? Yeah, yeah, better, better. I changed the headset. Okay. Okay, so to continue, I'm sorry for the little disturbance. And uh, to continue with the actual section, we are going to section the two from, you know, from the root to the from up of the from to the root. You know, this is the axis in which we are going to section the key. And we are going to look upon the actual section. So, for example, the, I have number one here, number 22 here, and I have Number one here and 22 here. So I have 22 sections of, you know, these are the axial sections of the two, starting from the crown to the root. So, uh, for example, the section running through with the number one here appears here. Take a look at it. Only the cusp tips, right? Now, my section two is going to be just below the cusp tips. So I have my clinical crown coming. Likewise. Section three is slightly below, right? And slowly you begin to see the dentin within the enamel. It's running in that level where dentin and enamel are imaged. So, likewise, if you see, run through the section, each section as it goes down. Take a look at section seven. Section seven, you can start seeing the pulse chamber being visible here, the pulse chamber. Right? Likewise, down to the apex, down to the root apex, and then the bone beneath. So the axial sections are basically sections of the two running from the bottom from the root to the crown of the crown to the root. So this is uh, this is for your understanding. Right? This is the orientation crop, uh, and uh, you have the sections. So you can evaluate the two at different sections. So this is technically useful for root canals and root canal treatments and things like that. On the cantilever segments of dental caries, what level this is. So that's actual section of the two. The next one is the colonial section. That's the running from right? So you are running a mesial distal slicing of the two. So likewise, in a similar way, you will start seeing the teeth as you're moving from the mesial most end to the distal most end, and then the tooth disappears. So it is just disappear. So this is coronal sectioning of the two. In this section, we also have a good uh, you know, the buccal and the lingual cortical plates are evaluable, and you will also get uh, to measure the buccal lingual uh, direction, uh, length in the buccal lingual direction. Very useful for implant planning. Definitely very useful for implant planning. Okay, so that's your coronal section. Likewise, the tarsal section. Tarsal section runs from the buccal to the lingual side, and in the tarsal section also, your uh, if you choose your axis correctly, then once again you can derive your according to your relationship of the uh, you know bone to make your measurements. Again, this is also very critical in uh, implant planning. So these are the statical sections, likewise, how to read. So by now, I hope you understood how uh, to orient yourself towards the different planes. So technically, you can have three planes. Axial, sagittal, and coronal. So these are the three planes which are uh, often referred to as the three dimensions or a 3D, 3D, 3D. So these are the three planes which as doctors we need to understand and study them in them. Uh, whereas the reconcept is a toy, please remember, and you can use this toy to educate your patient or make them understand the process of the treatment which you have planned. So that's the part one, the first objective. I hope all of you have are now comfortable with the orientation aspect of it. And uh, now let's look into the few common oral lesions that are you common know, for the oral Dr. Jagat? Yes. Dr. Jagat? Yes. Uh, we'll have a Please short break. Yeah, yeah. We'll have a short break, like two minutes. Okay. Um, meantime, you can shift your venue from there to our place where the net connection is stable and voice quality okay. of better. Okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll be coming. I will send uh, somebody to pick you up. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. Participants kindly hold up just to give us a moment. Sir? Yeah, two minutes. Uh, yeah, we will. Yeah, we'll get back to you. Please hold up. Sir, this is Dr. Dinesh. Sir.
can we run it? I can use it in this way. That will not connect. Okay, sorry for that little break, and uh, I'm sorry for the bad uh, connection. So let me just go back a few slides, and uh, let us quickly give a back of the first part again. So. These were the, I'll, I'll give a quick wrap of the three orientation planes. We have sagittal, frontal, and your axial or the transverse plane. Then this is how they look. On a, these are the three reconstruct models on axial, coronal, and sagittal sections, the three-dimensional ones that I was uh, talking to you. The pictures in the lower, the images in the lower section of the, or the second row are the ones that we are going to, as doctors, require to you know, formulate our diagnosis. And, uh, okay, so we've looked into this, the axial section, that is when we begin sectioning from the base of the mandible to the vault of the skull. You know, that's, uh, take a good look at the loaf of bread, how it is sliced, you know, considering the lowermost uh, part of the bread being the mandible to the vault of the skull. So those are going to be your axial sections. And this is a gross anatomy picture of uh, you know, an axial section, and this is how it looks on a radiograph. So that is its appearance on a radiograph. The next is our sagittal section. A quick revamp again. This is like you know cutting the bread from one end to the other, making bread sticks out of it. So even the skull, we are going to cut it out from one end to the other. So doing that, we are going to get the sagittal section. So this is one of the sagittal sections and this is exactly how it appears on a radiograph. Then, when we are going to apply the same sections on, you know, the tooth, then here they are. The first one that you look into here is your axial section of the tooth, right? So this is a slice that is passing from, you know, the root to the crown. This is coronal running from front to the back, the next one. And finally, it's the sagittal. So let's peek into all the three. Ah, yes, here we are, the axial section again. The axial section again. So in the axial section, So with the axial section, uh, I have already uh, told you that it runs from the apex to the crown or from the crown to the apex, right? These horizontal slices. So you, I told you how you can uh, you know, interpret them from top to bottom, right? Then coronal section likewise, running anteroposteriorly between the teeth. So it runs from uh, the mesial end to the distal end of the tooth. The sections run from the mesial end to the distal end of the tooth. And I also uh, told you about the buccal and the lingual cortical plates, which are easily evaluable in your coronal section. So we are one of the critical uh, sectioning. And this sectioning is a blessing in disguise for us to understand the buccolingual relation you know, and the pattern of bone is another thing that we can uh, estimate on this section. Finally, the sagittal section. The sagittal section is, you know, and now once again, we are making bread sticks out of our skull, running from one end to the other end, that's from left to right, from one side to the other, not end, I'm sorry, from one side to the other. So we have uh, multiple sections here. 
So the moment you look at sections like this, I know your heart starts pounding. You, know? you would not understand what is this, where it is running from. Always look, kindly look for this guide, the pilot, right? The pilot tells us the sections, no? So it says one here and it says 10 here, right? So now I am, uh, sorry, it says one to 19. I have one to 19, so I have 19 sections. So if you look into these sections, each section has a number, one to 19, right? So if I am, if you see the line uh, next to the one, so if I am running the section as section one, so this is the image of section one. So obviously if I'm going to take the next section, for example, this is five, sorry, this is five. So I look into section five. So at this level, this is the image. So you can carry out your planning based on the section number. So you can get n number of sections like this. The thickness of each section also can be determined, predetermined. You know, however, even if you are working live with the software, you can determine the thickness of your section. So that's the sagittal section. So that was our primary objective. I hope all of us are uh, clear with uh, or you are oriented to looking into your CPCG. So now looking at the sections, I think you should not fear anymore. The next thing would uh, be, let's look into a few pathologies. So this is one interesting uh, case that I had a lot of pathologies in one shot. So I, I'll be spending some time with this image. Now we looked into the three sections, the three dimensions. Yes, lovely. But now we are looking into another uh, image here, something that looks like an OPG, right? So all of us are familiar with OPG. This looks like an OPG. It's wonderful. But uh, interestingly, this is not an OPG. And uh, on a CBCT, it is called a curvy linear section. It's called a curvy linear section. It looks like an OPG, but it is not an OPG. It's the first point. Second point, OPG and CBCT are completely different technologies. They do not have anything in common. For example, if you look into an OPG, uh, the basic principle of an OPG is uh, it would just have a focal trough area. Now take a look at this axial section just to explain OPG in brief. OPG would have a fixed point, that is the center point you know, through which my uh, cursor is right now running. It has this fixed point through which it would image and only that one section of image is what you see as an OPG, right? And nothing, uh, you know, anterior to that uh, focal trough or posterior to that focal trough is visible. That's an OPG. So it's got huge limitations, right? But CBCT, now in uh, Hello. Yes. So uh, acquiring images on a CBCT, we are acquiring the entire volume. We are acquiring the entire volume. That is the entire mandible. The data for the entire mandible is there, not just a slice like in OPG. In OPG, only one slice is available as an image. But here, the entire mandible is available for us for manipulation. So now I trace the arch. Now this is the mandibular arch. I trace this arch at this given point and once I have traced this is the image of this particular plane. So this plane, the image of this plane is seen here as a curvy linear section. So I hope you understand now the difference. If I do not want, I can, in, I can start tracing right next to the first plane. I can even trace a second plane and get an image of that as well. That is why this is called curvy linear section. And I can have a number of sections within the width of this particular bone. So that is curvy linear section for you. It looks like an OPG. So obviously our eyes move to it. That's uh, you know that's an image that all of us recognize very well, right? Compared to axial, coronal, and sagittal, OPG is something that we see every day. So automatically we are more comfortable. So I'm going to use this image to make you feel comfortable and at the same time understand the three sections. So let's look into a few pathologies. Take a look at the six, six, no? typical, you know, periapical radiolucencies. 
both the uh, you know mesial root as well as the distal root you may not get this image you know to uh, this resolution even on an iop right it's perfect with its size it's perfect with its shape and it's perfect with its existence so basically this image is telling us in reality how this particular lesion is right so this is one point that we are going to discuss today this tooth then we have a few empty sockets here extracted sockets then destroyed bone and root stump so there are quite a number of features that we can understand from this particular section so now you have seen the two radiolucencies right okay so with these two radiolucencies i have cut out an axial section here that is i am look this axial section here is like looking at this image from the top it's like looking at the mandible from the top and peeping from the top so take a look at the axial section the root around the root you see the radial lucency this is the distal root and this is the mesial root right the mesial and the distal root so i am able to clearly demarcate the radial lucency around my roots so this is going to be of a paramount importance to the endodontist you know the endodontic point of view yes the lesion appearance and so i can go further down till the root tip and find out what is the uh, you know extent of the lesion from the tip of the root to the tip of the lesion itself so my measurements are possible even in those directions so this is with the axial section so there's a periapical pathology very clearly evident and the axial section reveals now i am also giving you if you take a peek at this image here this image here is the sagittal section of this root right runs from the buccolingual direction no the sorry the buccolingual relation so take a look at the root tip and the size of the lesion below so this is you know a luxury this is something that we uh, tend uh, not to see with this clarity on an iop right so this is another luxury to us and at the same time take a look at this uniform structure here that's the canal the mandibular canal so we need to be careful with that so we can even find out the relationship of the periapical pathology to the mandibular canal do we have sufficient healthy bone in between things like that so these are classic points where a cbct scores against a conventional iop right now take a look at this image it's the same image the same patient take a look at this buccolingual relation now this is the mental foramen exiting you know the canal you see the break in the cortex here so the mental foramen is exiting here out so the canal is going to exit at this point so take a look at the now once again this uh, image characteristic is not a possibility with your conventional radiographs so this is a golden point to score with the cbct likewise you see the blue uh, axis here now this is a socket extracted to socket so i have aligned my axis here and this is an image of the axis now you are looking at the same uh, extracted socket in a buccolingual relation here now you are getting a buccolingual relation this is you are looking at a curvilinear section you are kind of looking at the socket from the front right more of a coronal view axis but here i'm sorry i am sorry yes but here you are getting a buccolingual view of the socket so we want to understand the socket whether this is uh, whether the socket is uh, healing or non healing and you know a number of uh, pathologies can be eyed with this particular view likewise if you see the marrow spaces here are kind of slightly enlarged and they are in a process of healing that means this is a healing socket recent extractions possibly and the sockets are healing so we have healthy marrow down here and these marrow spaces here are slightly enlarged that means they are closing a response closing an inflammatory response so that's uh, you know the buccolingual relationship for you from the particular section so now i'm still with the same patient and the same uh, so we are taking a look at the axial section here again we are in the same level you can see the radial lucencies 
Now, this is the 3D reconstruct, you know, the toy here. Take a look at what's happened to the bone, you know. Take a look at what's happened to the bone. You are, are, are you able to see complete percussion involvement, severe loss of bone, you know, parotidally compromised, all these things. So, a uh, 3D image is now, uh, this is a reconstruct from all the three dimensions. And the reconstruct is giving you the actual clinical picture as to how it looks in the patient. So if you click a picture of the patient, this is how her uh, clinical presentation, her or his clinical presentation would be. So now if I'm going to look at the section here, this is the coronal section, right? And take a look at the lesion. And this is the mental foramen here. Right? And this is the bone, surrounding bone, healthy bone. And take a look. Well-defined borders. So there are cystic changes happening here. That means it is a chronic process. Likewise, on the opposite side, these were the root stumps, opposite side. You know? And uh, even here, you have a lot of pathology and bone loss. Take a look at the widened uh, marrow spaces, which are in response to the inflammatory process of the periapical pathology. Likewise, take a look at the sagittal section, giving you a very clear picture of the lesions in the periapical region. Right? So you have all the three views, you know, your sagittal view here, your coronal view here, and your, sorry, and your axial view here. So all these three views put together have given you a reconstruct with the mandible. So I hope your uh, understanding towards the sections and you know trying to understand the pathologies is slowly on a upscale. And uh, next, let us look into it's still the same patient. I have uh, given you a buccolingual relationship here, a cross section of the tooth. Now this is uh, technically to show you a few structures and uh, you know the ease with which, the ease with which uh, you know you can interpret them. So the enamel, this is your enamel. It's very clearly demarcated from the dentin below, and then this is your pulp chamber and your pulp canal, right? Then after that is your bone. This is your the outer cortical bone that is clearly demarcated and you have a cancellous bone with the bone marrow present here. Now, the interesting part is this is the cemento enamel junction on both the sides and this is where the bone is meant to begin. But interestingly, you see this is a predominantly compromised tooth where this is the amount of bone that has been lost. Likewise, if you look into the labial side surface of the tooth, there is severe bone loss. Now, this is the cemento enamel junction. The bone is meant to be at that level, but the bone is somewhere down the midway of the root. Apart from that, you would also figure out flakes of calculus. Take a look at that. That's one flake of calculus. That's another flake of calculus. So suggestive of poor oral hygiene, severe bone loss. You know? So these are classically available on a CBCT. So there, even uh, people who are looking into it for the first time, the young ones who are just becoming doctors, it's very easy for them to figure out such uh, changes on a CBCT. Whereas this can be a serious challenge on an IOPA and you do need some amount of expertise and experience before you make a decision, a conscious decision on the actual status of the tooth. So, this is just a peek into how edentulous arches look on a three-dimensional reconstruct. I have all the three sections here of an edentulous arch, an old uh, a geriatric patient. So this is the axial section, clean, no teeth. Teeth have been lost long ago. There, are no, there is no representation of the sockets either. Likewise, this is the sagittal section of the same patient. Take a look at the arch. This is the mandible. This is the maxillary arch. And this little radiolucency here is your incisive uh, canal, right? The canal is here. If I take an axial section at this level, I would be able to see the foramen. If this axial section was at this level, I would be looking at the incisive foramen. But because it is a sagittal section, I'm looking at the entire canal, the incisive canal, right here, the radiolucency there. So that's a normal anatomic landmark. Likewise, this is the coronal section. I'm able to see the mandible on both left and right, right and left side, right? The edentulous uh, mandible. 
So I, if I move through the coronal section from front to back, then I would have a clear picture of the entire arch. So based on the three sections, my reconstruct gives me an image like this, the side profile, and this is looking at it from below. The base of the mandible is here. This is the base of the mandible. This is the phallus. So I'm just, uh, I have just given you a reconstruct image when you look at your head from below. So this is just a jump over slide. Uh, take a look at the restorative material, how it looks. So this, uh, take a look at an implant, you know, your GP material. Uh, these are some of the latest uh, CBCT softwares where the artifacts due to metal have been minimized to a very great extent. The uh, earlier generation uh, CBCTs, they did have a lot of artifacts, uh, you know, artifacts, uh, especially streaking Straking of images uh, used to happen because of the metal and uh, all of that has been reduced to a great extent uh, and take a look at this uh, you are able to even figure out the entire uh, outline and shape of the implant otherwise it would, if it would have streaked then you would not be able to get this fine detail on the implant so you are having CBCTs which have really refined and worked on their software so the next uh, image uh, that I would like to spend a little time with you is first let's look into the normal. This is uh, basically put up here for the sake of the maxillary sinus. So take a look at the 3D reconstruct. You have a blue line here. That's a plane. So this plane is running along the condyle here. If you take a look at this, this is the condyle. And uh, this one would be at the maxillary actual level. So my three sections are focused at this plane, you know, the, the blue line that I have uh, drawn here, right? Okay, so first let's look at the axial section. I am able to look at the maxillary sinuses of both the sides, right and the left. They are pretty clear and that, that is this level, you know, I have the maxillary sinus here. So you have to take a look at them, right? That's the axial section. And at the same level, I also have my condyle. So interestingly, take a look at this. This is the condyle on one side and this is the condyle on the other side. Now, this is, mind you, the axial section. So I'm looking at the condyle as though I'm looking from the top of the head. If I'm peeking into the patient's head from the top, this is how the condyle would look. And the maxillary sinus is here, right? So likewise, if I'm at the same level, I'm taking a coronal section. So this is like looking into the mirror. Now take a look at the maxillary sinuses. The maxillary sinuses are here, and when you are looking at yourself in the mirror from the front, this is how the maxillary antrum looks. Right? You have your mid sagittal. I'm sorry. You have this is the mid sagittal plane, but you have your uh, nasal septum, the nasal concave here, and your maxillary sinuses. So this is the mirror view. Right? If you're looking at yourself, and this is the side view. So in the side view or the lateral view, rather, to be more technically specific, we are saying taking a look at it as a sagittal view or the lateral view. So in the lateral view, you are able to see the cross section of your entire heart palate here, the tooth, and this is the mandible. So once again, your buccolingual relationship of the mandible is very clearly evaluable on in this in this line here, right? So this is for the maxillary sinus. Basically, I have. Uh, sketch this here for the sake of maxillary sinus. Now, the next slide, we would look into a few pathologies that involve this maxillary sinus, right? So here we are, the pathologies of the maxillary sinus. Now take a look at the first image here. This is the sagittal section of the maxillary sinus from the posterior. I'm looking at it from behind. So this is a maxillary sinus, the radiolucency, but then you're looking at this radio opaque tissue growing in. Right? So it's a case of maxillary sinusitis, right? where the, li the lining mucosa of the maxillary sinus has thickened, possibly due to an allergic reaction, possibly due to an allergic reaction because it is uneven on all the sides. Right? So this is uh, one way of evaluating the maxilla. Likewise, if I take a look at this particular case, they are all independent cases, they are not the same. So take a look at this case, it's an axial section and I have a maxillary polyp. Take a look at this with the three points. It's a polyp. And I have one even here on the other sinus growing. They are at two different sizes. So probably they are triggered at two different uh, you know, uh, aspects of uh, time. So these are maxillary polyps. So the radiolucency is encroached with a radiodense 
uh, column. Take a look at the coronal section here. The coronal section is uh, revealing that the entire sinus is filled with you know, haziness and radio opacity. Whereas the other side, the sinus is perfectly radio loosened. So this is depicting a space occupying lesion within the maxilla. Likewise, the axial sections, if you carefully run through these sections, you will see that if you take a look at this. So slowly there is, as you go down the section, you are able to clearly see a polyp within the sinus, right? So these are the maxillary uh, sinus structures. Audible? Am I audible? Okay, that's nice. So next we would briefly look into how a temporomandibular joint looks in various sections on a CBCT. So the coronal, sagittal and the axial sections of the temporomandibular joint. Take a look at this. This is uh, this is a coronal section running anteroposteriorly. So you, you are able to see the condyle here and this is the disc space and this is your articulating surface. Right, so this is an actual posterior view of your temporomandibular joint, so possibly a coronal section, and this is also a same similar coronal section of your TMJ. Now, this is a sagittal section of your TMJ. Take a look at the condyle here. This is your articular eminence, and this is your glenoid fossa. This is your external auditory meatus here, right here. So you can understand the relationship of your condyle to your glenoid fossa and the anterior extent of the condyle. Likewise, if I make, uh, if I take this, this is an axial section, and you are able to see the condyles from the top. So they look at the right and the left condyles are clearly visible here. Right. So we have a lateral view, we have an axial view, and we have an anteroposterior or even coronal view. This is how the condyles look in normal anatomy. This is how they look in normal anatomy. Let, let us look into two small pathologies related to the condyles. So here they are. Now take a look at this. This is the coronal section of the condyle and you are able to see two tiny cysts here. These are subchondral cysts in the condyle. Technically, this is very difficult to achieve on the conventional TMJ views. Uh, it is next to impossible to find them. You know, on conventional views, you know, the, especially subchondral cysts of this size. You know, but on a CBCT, everything is caught. Everything is caught. The finest of the detail is available, provided we know how to browse through the volume. All you need to do is browse through the volume. Take a look at the other picture here. The other axial section is a different shape of the condyle. The shape of the condyle is bifid. Here, it's a bifid condyle looks like a bow, right? Looks like a bow. That's not the normal shape of the condyle. Whereas, look at the opposite side. The condyle is in normal anatomy. So, there is a unilateral bifid of the condyle, which is clearly caught on the axial view. Now, let's look into traumas. How traumas are going to, you know, uh, evaluating a trauma on uh, so the first image that I have here is that of a normal IOPA. So the moment we look into this IOPA, it takes some effort for us to figure out that something is wrong here, right? It takes some effort for us to really figure out something is wrong here. Then once we figure out something is wrong, we may even uh, you know, uh, probably dismiss this by saying uh, the obturation is not really great or it's uh, some problem with the obturation. But then the same image when you go for a CBC to take a look at the clarity with which it exposes the fracture. The clarity with which it exposes the fracture. Right? So this is the fracture line. The tooth is fractured. And this is the, you know, the 3D sagittal section on a 3D NPR. Likewise, this is the coronal section. If take a look. This is a different case. Just don't mix up with this. So here, uh, a coronal section revealing two vertical fractures, sorry, two horizontal fractures. Two horizontal fractures, very clearly evident on the coronal section. Now, take a look at this fracture line here. These are not possible on, uh, you know, visualization of your conventional radiographs. And a reconstruct 
of the same. Take a look at the fracture line. It's very clearly evident here. Take a look at this. So these are the reconstruct out of these images. So trauma of the dental structures is very uh, simple on a CBCT. Likewise, a few more images here. A few more images here of trauma. So take a look at this. The sagittal sections of your upper anterior teeth where there have been fractures, fractures exposed. Here are the fractures, the fracture links. These are not possible uh, for us to be, you know, evaluating on a conventional radiographs. It's very difficult to evaluate these fracture lines on conventional radiographs. So here we are. So take a look at this, the axial section of the maxilla and the, three, the anterior portion of the maxilla. This, these are the sections that we are experiencing here, right? 8, 9, 10, 11. So here is number 10. So these are the sections that are available to us here. And they clearly point out the fracture segment of the tooth. And here is the reconstruct again, showing us the fracture line here, right? So th th this would be really useful in uh, educating the patient, right? So that, that's the 3D model. Now another uh, Take a look at the axial section of the zygomatic arch, right? There is a fracture line here, in the axial section of the zygomatic arch in the axial section, right? Now take a look at the mandible. Now this is, this is a reconstruct model. Look at the fracture line running along the base of the mandible. But when you're looking at the axial section here, this is our, this is our field here, right? We have a fracture line running involving the entire base of the mandible here. The lingual particle plate has been fractured. Likewise, take a look at this. The base of the mandible has been fractured. You see a clear fractured line. And here, the clarity of the fractured line involving the bone and then runs through the tooth and the part of the tooth is also fractured. So you have a dentoalveolar fracture here, right? So this is something which is, once again, very difficult or challenging to evaluate on a conventional radiogram. Likewise, take a look at this axial section here. You know, the fracture lines, you not know, the black points here, take a look at these fracture lines. So these are classical, the number of fractures available you now it's, it's one, two, three, four, five. You know, it's very difficult to uh, figure out these fracture lines on your conventional submental vertex view. You, know, you take a submental vertex view or a jet handle view for your zygomatic arch fractures, but then it's not easy to locate you know, the complexity of the fractures. The complexity of the fractures, it's only possible on a CBCT. Now, the next one I would like to take a peek into is impacted tooth. Let's take a look at the impacted tooth. Yes, there we are. So, all of us uh, understanding, you know, trying to localize an object on a radiograph, you know, is it buccally placed or is it lingually placed? That's a million dollar question for an oral surgeon, you know, trying to get rid of a tooth, you know. So we had uh, you know, techniques like slob rule to figure out where the tooth was, things like that. Now, those are things of past. Once you have a CBCT, those are things of the past. Take a look at the first uh, image here. Now the axial section. Take a look at the tooth. An impacted, a horizontally impacted third mole. I'm having a bird's eye view. I'm looking at it from the top. And it's fast asleep. Here it is. And now the surgeon has a sufficient knowledge of the width of the buccal particle plate and the width of the lingual particle plate. The buccal particle plate and the lingual particle plate. So it is easy for them now to decide and plan surgery. Not only that, take a look at this radiolucency here, right in front of the crown, right? Possibly the dental follicle is intact. That means this has not erupted. And that's another message. Meanwhile, take a look at the same axial section on the opposite side. The tooth is missing. Possibly they have removed this tooth uh, you know, a few days earlier or something like that. So it gives us a clear cut relationship of the tooth to the bone. Now, take a look at this IOP. Interesting. Take a look at the morphology of the root here, you know, dilacerated. You know, just because of the GP, we are able to figure out that it is dilacerated and it has curved canals, right? Now, I am planning to extract this tooth, you know, 
and then I'm going to be in real trouble because the CBCT shows me this image. Take a look at this, right? Take a look at the curvature of the root. If I attempt extracting this, I will fracture it in two places. One is at this level, one is at this level. And then there's a variable pathology added to right? The spike and someone attempted, uh, you know, the root canal treatment, but you know, the GP ends here. That means the rest of the root is, they have no clue of the rest of the root. So this is just possible because of the buffer lingual relationship or the sagittal section that I achieved on my CBCT, which is not possible on a regular IOPA. So that's how wonderful the you know, technology is for just available there for us to learn and use it. Likewise, let us take a look at another classical case here. This is an OPG. Take a look at the impacted canine here. The patient is undergoing orthodontic treatment, obviously. Now look at the braces and the wires running all over. So what information do we have about this particular impacted tooth? We do not know whether it is palatally placed, whether it is labially placed. We have no clue. But then one CBCT, one CBCT, and take a look at the coronal section. Take a look at the tooth. You know the tooth, it is where it is placed and at what angle it is placed. Now it becomes easy for the surgeon to remove, a reconstruct of the same thing. See, the tooth is palatally placed, right? That's a 3D reconstruct. It's a volume rendered image, a 3D VR. So here is the actual section that gives away all the all the news, all the news about the tooth and its relation to the palate. Likewise, we we'll just take a peek at an odentome. Take a look at this: a huge, massive odentome, which is not, uh, you know, it's not in the shape or structure of a tooth. And uh, take a look at the reconstruct models. Take a look at the base of the mandible; it is intact, so the odentome has not. Uh, damage the base of the mandible. Likewise, take a look at the sagittal view in the reconstruct and the anthroposterior or coronal view in the reconstruct. This is just an image, so nothing to get startled about it, but it's just an orento. Let's quickly look into a dentigerous cyst also available with us here. This is the reconstruct, the lesion around the tooth. This is another case, but there are tooth with a huge lesion. And take a look at the uh, coronal section and uh, you know, the lesion around the tooth. This kind of an information is not possible for us with the conventional radiogram. This is self-explanatory. Take a look. The tooth is impacted, right? And the cyst is surrounding the tooth, classical dentigerous cyst. If I'm taking a buffer lingual relationship of this particular lesion, then you see the, the lesion entirely around the tooth. That is the dentigerous cyst, and this is the tension, the tooth itself. And then I have measurements which are perfect to the point. So these are measurements which are perfect to the point. So that gives me a good, uh, uh, that would probably give me good confidence in planning my surgical excision of this particular lesion along with the tooth. So a lot of information there on uh, 3D, CBCT or the cysts. Likewise, quickly take a look at another picture of amyloblastoma. Okay. So this is the curvilinear section and this is a 3D reconstruct model and it gives us, I'm sorry, plus So I have the, uh, you know, the amyloblastoma here, picture of amyloblastoma. Kindly excuse me for a minute. Yes. So take a look at the axial section. Take a look at the axial section of the amyloblastoma here. So we are seeing a clear perforation of the liquid cortical plate. And take a look at the extent of the lesion at a higher level in an axial section. And this is an axial section. That's a huge lesion. And uh, this is a sagittal view. Take a look at the impacted tooth here and the size of the lesion, root resorptions. So these are, and, you know, this is another case with the classical, you know, scallop borders. And this is the reconstruct of the scallop borders. 
so a tumor this is how a tumor looks so it gives away on a conventional radiograph it's very difficult to get such fine details you know in this manner but uh, on a cbct yes it's a big possibility so as we are wrapping up i would not want to leave behind malignant tumors take a look at the 3d reconstruct of a malignant tumor where it has caused a complete perforation of the bone you know this is a 3d reconstruct model if you are looking at the axial section here yeah, take a look at the perforation of the bone this is another case there are two different cases and uh, let me be clear about that right so here a radiolucency on a conventional image but then here here is the lesion with a severe bone loss and uh, the axial sections are not very contributory but the curvilinear section is giving away the lesion and uh, the in case of osteoradial necrosis this is a typical x-ray this is a typical x-ray which gives us you know the scotched pattern but take a look at a 3d reconstruct model it's uh, something that would uh, tell the you know you can always use this to tell the severity of the problem to the patient to explain to the patient the severity right and uh, take a look at the axial section uh, this granulation and you know a lot of uh, haphazard bone around the architecture of the bone is being lost so this is one another thing which uh, would help us you know, in the diagnosis but this is a good reconstruct model these are basically uh, not my patients or materialist uh, these particular images have been uh, borrowed from the internet they are available for your visualization there so you can go through them and uh, that much for our lecture today on understanding you know the orientation uh, planes of a cbct and you know understanding a few complications i would like to acknowledge my uh, parents teachers and everyone from who and what i am today and i would hope all of you are uh, aligned with me in that thought and uh, from that i would like to thank you all for your time and uh, i would invite all the questions that you have in mind i'm here to discuss for some time with you so i would like to uh, you know answer your questions hello sir good morning yes I am Dr. Ansari. I am a postgraduate student, sir, oral medicine. Yes. Sir, I have a doubt that uh, what's the role of CBCT in SNAP, that is a surgical navigation advanced platform. Mm -hmm. What can be uh, the role of CBCT in that? Uh, okay. Can I have a question again, doctor? I am sorry. Yeah, my question is that what can be the role of CBCT in yes. SNAP, that is surgical navigation advanced platform? Yes. So what can be the role? Is it useful in this? Uh, it, it, it's kind of subjective, doctor, what you're asking. Yes, it can be useful, but uh, it, treatment planning it depends. It really depends on how the case, or what is the case, because extents are perfect on a CBCT. Now, uh, if you are looking in for, uh, you know, uh, reconstruct of uh, surgically removed tissue, you know, then you do have platforms for them. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Indicator. Yeah. What uh, for what cases we need curvilinear section? Uh, is a question from Janardhan. Dr. Janardhan. Yes. Curvilinear sections. Yes, doctor. Basically, curvilinear sections are uh, uh, you know obtained and they're they're designed for implants. So if you look into the softwares, they have uh, you know uh, the one one of the windows specially dedicated for your uh, implants right in in that you have to trace your arch so as you trace your arch you know the curvilinear section forms by itself so curvilinear section is technically for you know uh, uh, something that will orient you better to understand because all of us are very well versed with opgs now it looks like an opg so you know it kind of helps us in orienting ourselves to what we are looking at and uh, yes it is just for implants as you trace your arch, you do the arch tracing, your curvilinear section keeps forming, you know, right next to it. Any other questions? Sir, it's me again, Surya Vamshi. 
Yes. So what can be the minimum KB, KBP and uh, minimum milliamperes or the maximum KBP and the milliamperes to get a CBCT image, sir? You see, every uh, CBCT machine comes with its own uh, parameters, right? So it's up to you to choose. It's not like an OPG machine, but it's up to you to choose uh, depending on uh, you know the exposure, the FOV that you select, and also the size and structure of the skeletal makeup of the patient. Depending on that, you'll have to choose. There are no uh, fixed uh, you know uh, parameters that I can really give you. Okay, thanks. So another thing is, can CBCT be used in fusion imaging, sir? Yeah. I am not really sure about this. Fusion imaging, I'm, I'm not really sure because right now data transfer from CBCT for 3D printing is being done with the NXT extensions. Yes. But uh, fusion imaging, I'm, I'm really not sure, doctor. I have not come across it uh, as of date. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. It was a very informative and enlightening session. Um, we would be uh, sending a feedback form in the WhatsApp group as well as the Zoom chat. The filling of the form is mandatory for certification. We, uh, Dr. Jagat, we present you a certificate of appreciation from Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences. Uh, I will be just sharing it with you right now. Uh. I have another question from one uh, Dr. Chitra. The uh, question says, is CBCT compulsory for cysts and tumors or an OPG alone is sufficient? Uh, okay, so that's an interesting question. CBCT is an advanced uh, radiology imaging uh, technique where uh, the amount of information it will flood you with is way beyond that of an OPG. But then everything comes with a cost. So it's up to you to decide whether an OPG is sufficient because the exposure parameters of an OPG are a lot less compared to a CBCT. But a CBCT's exposure parameters are a lot less than a regular CT or a medical CT. So it's up to you to decide. If you have all the data required on an OPG, then I don't see a necessity to go towards a CBCT. But on the same note, I would also want to tell you something that slowly OPG is becoming obsolete. You know, most of the Western countries, uh, probably a decade ago, they were, uh, it, it was compulsory for them to have an OPG for every patient who walks in for screening. It becomes a basic screening tool, OPG. But today, CBCT is filling in, uh, you know, that place. It's taking the place of an OPG. It's already taken the place of an OPG in countries like the United States. And even most of the European uh, countries now, CBCT is becoming a basic diagnostic tool. So I don't think we are far behind. And uh, I leave that to your discretion, you know, because uh, you should weigh the importance of the condition you are dealing with and the exposure you are going to put the patient through. Right? If it's not really required, always stick to anything that exposes the patient to less amount of radiation. Mm, okay, Nishant in Malay. Is sagittal and uh, sorry, is sagittal axle and sagittal plane the same? See, basically they are uh, planes. Okay, plane or axis. You know, it means a particular side. Okay, so you, you should understand something. See, axial, sagittal, and coronal planes are also called orthogonal planes. Right? When you open up a CBC software, you see a window called orthogonal plane. Right? Orthogonal simply means a straight line. Ortho means straight. So, yes, basically they are three planes. Find some planes or axis, it's to your convenience, but always please stick to you know the axis. Sayad Abdul. Uh, what is the advisable time interval between two CBCTs for a patient without harming the patient? Okay, that's a nice question, Doc. But uh, normally, we tend to leave at least a 24-hour uh, gap between a CBCT. And interestingly, uh, something which I would want to bring to your notice is uh, we don't repeat CBCTs, unlike 
you know they, they cannot be positioning errors or you know it's more of a fixed uh, protocol procedure so uh, i think uh, the cbct is taken the entire volume is achieved uh, the exposure time with uh, the available speed of cbct machines today i don't think we are going to cross 20 seconds of exposure which is like really great and fast compared to the previous ones so i don't think we are going to repeat cbcts unlike the you know conventional radiographs which have technical challenges thank you dr jagar you can hear me i i i have a question for you sure sir uh, what about uh, research point of view there are uh, propositions for uh, cbct uh, aligned researches no take multiple cbcts and all. so a lot of ethical concerns are there so what is your say on that like yes there uh, is a gray line no uh, cbct is available you know uh, in most of the places today and uh, yes it does uh, we do have to deal with a considerable amount of exposure to the patient when compared to uh, you know uh, opgs which are which were the highest exposure parameters or were having yes we can use them in research it's a wonderful tool lot of uh, scope uh, when it comes to research with cbct a number of studies can be done and it is not that we are going to repeat the cbct on the same day so even if you have to expose the patient at a gap of 3 or 4 days is justifiable to a great extent so i cannot really draw lines but uh, it's not that we cannot uh, repeat you know to and uh, more than anything it's a standard procedure and it's a standardized procedure so repeating a cbct will you know really not because it's, it's acquiring the entire data as such so your standardization will never be a problem with the C cbct so why i asked this question was uh, there was one proposal which got rejected uh, because it was a lateral cephalogram and it has to be taken for a patient uh, which he doesn't need that so uh, the ethics committee like they were contemplating on what would be the tomorrow if he comes with a lesion in the brain uh, then uh, they will they back to you uh, and uh, point to your fingers at you that you are taken one radiograph which is not needed for the patient and cbct obviously have a greater yes in, so in, in what about the given concerns? yes in the given uh, case scenario that you are talking to me a cbct also will not uh, run through the ethical committee they will not approve of because radiation is one thing where without justification you cannot expose the patient so let it be a lateral cef let it be an iop let it be a cbct or let it be a ct whatever it is any ionizing radiation Uh, definitely no ethical committee would uh, pass it through unless until it is a requirement for the patient so if your study group is uh, one such study group where a cbct is required to plan their treatment and uh, has to you know it's going to help in their treatment process it outweighs the risk benefit ratio then yes you will get an approval through if not even an iopa is not allowed leave alone cbct Dr. Yes. Santosh, our alumni has asked. Yes. Metrics measurement are approximate on CBCT, or there is a magnification factor. Yes, Santosh, that's a nice question, Santosh. I'm glad you asked. Okay. Metrics and measures on CBCT today, today are perfect to the millimeter. They are, they have submillimetric precision. There's no problem. The the earlier generation CBCTs had a little problem with uh, you know. Uh, the pixelating uh, the pixels in the midline uh, of the uh, midline structures or in the midline structures right but anyhow uh, the engineers have perfected it on the ray casting and some casting aspects and today we do not have those uh, errors there are no magnification errors on cbct you can very well depend on the, the measurements that you obtain on a cbct so yes you have no issues with the measurements you, you, they are dependable they are completely dependable ray casting and some casting have cre have you know eliminated that minor little problem that used to arise in the midline structures whereas in an opg huge problem magnification in the, it's, it's an inherent problem it cannot be corrected and then we start calculating the magnification defects based on the make of the machine so i don't think we can compare opg to a cbct uh i have another question from priyanka will this video be uploaded in the youtube yeah it will be uploaded yes. uh, it is already uploaded 
it is an it is online and it will be stored there you can visit the sbv youtube anytime uh, sorry uh, mr ganesh what about taking consent from the patient uh, yes uh, dr ganesh consent from the patient is a mandate in any procedure even a physical procedure that we carry out it is it has to be done with the consent of the patient only so obviously no consent from the patient there is no dentistry so cbct is only a part of dentistry yes we do need to take the consent from the patient then i have another question from bone quality assessment with cbct in respect to implant planning yes uh, nice question sir thank you for the question it uh, on a sagittal section yes we can you it's all, it's more than visible you can look into the uh, density of the bone decide whether it's d1 d2 d3 d4 you know it's clearly visible on your sagittal section and even your coronal section but just make sure that the plane is right when you are looking into it make sure the plane is right we get the you have to turn your uh, this thing and transaxial uh, i'm sorry not the transaxial your uh, Uh, your uh, plane for the uh, sectioning should be uh, parallel to you know the tooth and after that evaluate the bone another interesting thing is we do not use hounsfield units to under uh, you know to describe densities like in a conventional ct here we don't we have equivalent of hounsfield units here and uh, most of the softwares when you run the cursor through the bone it will start giving you numbers plus and minus minus being you know air and plus being uh, dense bone so based on those numbers you can decide the density of bone you are dealing with and uh, obviously understanding the uh, looking at the cortical uh, anatomy you will know whether it is d1 d2 d3 or d4 sorry you know what i have said the one more question they say the voxels are isometric in a ct when compared to cd ct so are the measurements So, are the measurements accurate in CT or CBC? Okay, who is this? Pritha. Doctor Pritha Krishna Murthy. Doctor Pritha Krishna Murthy. Yes. Uh, nice question, Doc. Thanks for asking. Uh, let me uh, get your understanding. Uh, I am going to contradict your understanding a little. On a CBC, the you know the voxels are isometric. On a CBC, on a regular CT, it, they are anisometric. Okay. the length and the breadth is not equal to the height on a regular ct cbct is designed you know for accuracy so the voxels are isometric that is why your measurements on a ct are perfect whereas you will have questionable uh, you know uh, adjustments to make on a general ct you know when it comes to measurements so uh, it, it's a clear uh, fundamental that you know it's isometric on a cbct not on a ct on a general ct they are anisometric one more question how to reduce artifacts by metal crowns or previous implants yes uh, this used to be a major problem before uh, but now you have a lot of uh, the software is self correcting you know they have done a lot they have worked a lot on those especially with the you know the care stream the latest version of care stream you know very good correction of but uh, usually the streak artifact the streak artifacts are Uh, you know, they, they are right now. They are auto corrected. You don't have to really worry about them. The older ones that have already been uh, procured, I don't think we can do much about them. One more question: How much percentage of error can be present in a CBCT? To my knowledge, and to the claim, uh, you know, by various companies, uh, there is no margin of error on a CBCT. you know that that's how the uh, they claim and another uh, another thing if we uh, practically look into it uh, half a millimeter or 1 millimeter is not really going to make a huge difference you know when it uh, comes even to sensitive issues so even if it is and even if we have to consider at such low levels uh, i don't know it's more of a you know a person's own judgment of 
how it's going to affect. But what the manufacturers claim nowadays is that there is no magnification error or problem of magnification arising from their equipment. And uh, even I feel that you know uh, that claim is probably right. But submillimetric uh, corrections are. I don't know where we are going to use submillimetric corrections. If no other questions are there, we can uh, close the session. So, uh, with this, I thank uh, Dr. Jagat Reddy for his time on behalf of uh, Sri Balaji Vidya Peet and Department of Prosthodontics and Crown and Bridge. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And, uh, sorry, participants, <laughs> for the uh, small uh, interruption in between. Uh, we will rectify it next time. Hope to see you in our future sessions. Uh, if you are interested in more webinars like this from us, you can remain in the group uh, or you can contact one of our uh, participants here. You can put your number. One phone number will be posted here. If you are interested, we will add you in our group for uh, information on more webinars like this in future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going Thank to end you. the session. See you all. Good day. Bye.